So we've done our signs and symptoms. We've gone and done our initial recce. We brought back a small sample, or in this case, three small samples of the solid product. Now, a couple safety notes. Don't do this unless you've been properly trained in these tests and you're familiar with all the procedures. And secondly, you do have to wear PPE. I know what these compounds are, so I can get away with safety glasses and nitrile gloves. You may not be able to because you don't know what it is. Some of the, if it's a water reactive compound, you could get shot in the eye with some chemical. That would be a bad day. Another safety note is to be very, very careful with the collecting your physical sample initially, especially if you're dealing with any kind of crystals. If you had a jar with crystals around the edge, you don't want to be scraping those crystals off. That could be a friction sensitive explosive and it will go off if you try and scrape it off or if you try to unscrew the lid. So you want to disturb the physical sample as little as possible when you're collecting that initial sample. And if it looks like, you know, stained old glass jars with crystals around the edges of lids, Basically, don't touch it. Call the bomb squad instead. So, with those caveats, we're now going to go forward and start our tests. We're going to get out our stripping kit. The first thing we're going to test for is, is this an oxidizer? Again, we're worried about explosives. That's our first thing because it'll blow us up and possibly other people as well. Explosives are a fuel and an oxidizer put together. So the oxidizer speeds up how fast the fuel burns, and kaboom. We can test for, uh, we can test for oxidizers. There are a couple different ways to do this. The easiest is with so-called starch paper, or oxidizer paper, or potassium iodide starch paper. In theory, you're supposed to wet this with hydrochloric acid. The reality is, it's, I've never needed to do it, and I've been told by people who know that basically you can just use water. So you're going to add a couple drops of water, just plain old water, to your oxidizer test strip, and you're going to lightly touch this against the sample. You're going to leave it there for a minute, give it time, some time to react. So a minute's gone by, and we're taking a look at these strips. As you can see, there's no color change here except for the green that's been added, but it hasn't turned blue or black. Turning blue or black is a sign of an oxidizer. Now, this is problematic, because I know what these chemicals are. I know that this is in fact an oxidizer. And that's a good point, that's a good lesson, because not every test will reveal every class of compounds. In this case, this test will not reveal nitrates and peroxides, or some peroxides, both of which are oxidizers. And that's why it says it on the sheet. Note that sometimes the color change is temporary, any black or blue color indication oxidizer. Also, this test will not detect nitrates and some peroxides. If this was a type of oxidizer the strip could detect, then part or all of it would turn black, just like this. And that's a, a dead giveaway that you do, in fact, have an oxidizer. The next step is a peroxide test. Peroxide tests are a little bit tricky because they do expire. These bottles do have shelf lives and they're not the easiest thing in the world to get. Still, peroxides are a type of oxidizer, and a lot of the uh, improvised explosives are made with them. So it is something that we do want to test for, and we do want to keep these tubes up to date. We take our strip, we add a bit of water to it, and we touch it to the actual physical Solid. Now, none of these are peroxides, so it's not going to react. If it was a peroxide, again, it would turn blue. You don't need to know this. It does say that on the sheet. Oxidizer test, peroxide test. That's two. What's the third thing? Maybe this stuff is water reactive. Maybe it bubbles when you add it to water. Maybe it releases a gas. That could be a flammable gas. Maybe it, um, it heats up or cools down. This is another thing that we're going to check. I'm going to take a little test tube. I'm going to add some water to the test tube. Just a one or two inches. And I'm going to add about a P of the compound to it. I'm pointing this away. Point it away from yourself. Point it at a friend. 
because if it is water reactive, this could shoot out. And I look at this for a minute. This could be a slow reaction. It could be a fast reaction. Is it becoming a gel? Is it becoming cold? Is it becoming hot? Is it boiling? Is it changing color? Is it turning milky? Is it bubbling a little bit? When I'm feeling it, I'm actually feeling it get quite cold, much colder than it was before. So if this starts bubbling like crazy, then we would test the off gases that were coming off with an LEL detector, a CGI, to see if that gas is flammable. That'd be pretty important information to have. Hey, when you mix this with water, we get a flammable gas release, released. So you can play junior chemist there. Now let's do this test again with another chemical that has a bit more of a violent reaction. So I want to be able to show this to you. We take this and we add the green crystals, which happen to be Drano. You can actually see it bubbling at the bottom now. And I can hear it bubbling. And it's getting quite warm. So now we know it's water reactive. It bubbles, so it's producing a gas and it heats up. This is good stuff to know when you're dealing with a small little amount of it, like about the size of a pea. Also, from personal experience, when you're mixing water in with your sample, don't add it to your entire sample. Take a subsample because you're going to need some dry sample later, either to ship off to a lab for analysis or even just to go on to the next, the next module in the sequence, which is the fun part. So you don't want to have to send guys in again to go get more solid just because you had so much fun adding water. Let's make a bit of a slurry with each of these compounds. Oh, will you look at that? This is beginning to off-gas like crazy and get quite hot. Wouldn't we rather know this in a small little controlled sample rather than a great big sample? So our initial tests have revealed that, guess what, one of our chemicals reacts with water the other one actually reacts with water as well. This one gets hot, this one gets cold, this one does nothing at all. Now the reason we're mixing it with a larger amount of water is so that we can have a slurry. We're going to test the pH of each of these three slurries and see what we come up with. So in the first, we've got a big pH change. It's turned dark blue. We'll consult our chart and we'll find out that that means it's a strong base. This one is also turned dark blue, another strong base. This one here, pretty much exactly the same color as what we had before, so bright orange. Now we're keeping track of this one sheet per chemical. We've got basic, basic, neutral, no reaction with water, turns hot and bubbles, turns cold. We've done our pH test. We've got one more class of tests to do, and that's the chemical classifier strips and the wastewater strips. There's a lot of redundancy here, but you might as well do both of them. First of all, because it's redundant and it gives you an added level of backup. Second of all, there's a couple of tests that are slightly different on these two strips. Most hazmat teams carry these, uh, these tests. With the wastewater strip, you've got to carefully peel off the plastic layer here to reveal your test windows. Use the uh, pH strip to transfer the liquid, or you can use a pipette to transfer the liquid. You just put a little drop in each of the five windows. Sometimes it can be a little bit hard to distinguish between the color of the liquid and the reaction that you're getting. But you add a little drop to each of the five windows. Once you've done this a couple of times, it's child's play. You look for color changes, and that can give you the next hint. You're going to write down the color change. Is it an acid or a base? As a matter of fact, both of these test out to be strong bases. Is it an oxidizer? Neither of these that I tested were oxidizers. Is, it a, does it, is there a hydrogen sulfide risk? Is there a fluoride risk? No and no, respectively. Is there a nitrate risk or a petroleum product risk? No. Iodine, bromine, or chlorine, or nitrate? No and no. So we've managed to narrow down our field of options uh, considerably. We know some more information about it. Is this where we stop? Well, maybe it is, 
Maybe it isn't. If we've been properly trained, and if it's appropriate, we can now go on to the next step, which is the really fun one, where we actually try and burn this stuff and try and figure out a bit more about it.